leading up, like, so what I, and this is something I learned from Ben too, because I shot with Ben that February, right after I got the second black belt patch. Um, I, I, t I took Ben's class and I was talking to him just, you know, cause he knows me cause I go shoot with him every year. And, um, I was asking him, how do you like match day? Like, how do you, what is your match prep? Like, and he's like, well, how much can you shoot? And they're like, well, I'll usually be shooting like, you know, like twice a day for the weeks leading up to it. And I'm like, hold up. Okay. <laughs> There's first of all, no <laughs> scenario where I get to shoot more than twice a week. Like none. And one of those will be like a club match, USBSA match. And one will be a practice session. And I'm too busy with work. That is best case scenario what's going to happen. And Ben just looks at me and goes, oh, it's going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> right, that, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was Ben's reaction. Good like, luck. Well, good luck, young son. <laughs> you know what I mean? Through the magic of television today, I forgot to hit record. So this is the intro. Welcome to the Big Tex Ordinance Podcast. <laughs> Today we're sitting down. We've got Ike in the studio, Ian's in the studio, and our guest, the not world famous Kirk Clark. What's up, guys? Dude, thank you for sitting down with us for an hour plus already and, and talking about all things Kirk. And for those of... <laughs> Our audience that don't know you, which they don't, please tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into firearms, and your journey up into this point. Uh, so my name is Kirk Clark, uh, K.A. Clark on the internets. I'm an average guy. I got a real job. Uh, I did what Claude Werner told me. I got a real job. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I've been shooting handguns fairly seriously off and on since I was 14 years old. Uh, started off, you know, my dad was just happy I was doing something semi-athletic for the first time in my life. So he just, you know, he uh, made sure to support that. And he let me go to sh learn how to shoot and go to shooting schools. Started at uh, Gravic Ranch, Jim Neistat. Branched out from there, so commercial firearms training. Did a little bit of USPSA. Let the gun magazines convince me that that was dangerous. Got out of that, unfortunately. And then I started training very seriously at the very end of 2010. Uh, my first real accomplishment was getting my gun sight e-ticket in December of 2010. Since then, uh, you know, I've won TACCON five times uh, out of seven attempts, third place the other two. And then um, I've got three black belt, excuse me, two black belt patches with Scott Jedlinski. I have three turbo pins with Gabe White. I have a fast coin, and I also have gotten a perfect score at the Rogers Shooting School four times. So those are my biggest accomplishments. I've podiumed at a couple IDPA majors, always the bridesmaid, haven't gotten first yet in my division, but I always shoot carry optics, so I mean, it's pretty rough. It's a rough crowd in carry <laughs> optics. So, uh, and I'm a grandmaster in SEAL Challenge in two divisions, and I'm a master class shooter in carry optics in USPSA. Alrighty then. Um, could you write that all yeah. down for us? <laughs> I mean, I almost always mess something up, you know what I mean? It's but. It's been said by multiple people, you're probably the most least known best shooter in the country, in most circles. Like, uh, Scott Jadlinski and I had a conversation about this, because, like, like in USBSA, I'm unremarkable. Like, I shoot to my classification. I, I shoot like an M-class guy in USBSA now. Um, in Steel Challenge, I shoot like a weak GM, which is kind of where I'm at in Steel Challenge. Um, you know, so it's technical shooting ability. There's tons of people that will just smoke me at a, at a match. Right. But, um, man, I've been smoked by like, like 16 year olds in matches. Like <laughs> these things happen. Seal challenge is a very humbling sport for those of you who don't know. These kids are wilding out there, but, uh, for what I do and what I care the most about, you know, like technical shooting from under a t-shirt with a gun you might actually carry at some point in your life, uh, I'm very confident in my abilities there. And um, more than anything, I think what I'm good at is if I determine, like, hey, I want to get good at X, I feel like I'm really good at finding a way to build my skills and my mental preparation, everything to where, okay, on game day I can deliver that. While at the same time, being robust and able to shoot pretty good at everything, like, I'll show up and shoot pretty good at any kind of handgun shooting you want me to do. But if I really focus in on something, I can roll with darn near anybody in this space and you also do a little bit of jujitsu 
I am the world's worst purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> so uh, I'm really good at uh, Achilles locks and toe holds. Uh, pretty much everything else I'm kind of just winging. <laughs> so. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to drive up here today and sit down with us on the Big Tex Ordinance Podcast. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Guys. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good introduction. That was a good intro, yeah. And now through the magic of television, we can reset that. <laughs> You know, he'd want to take me hunting. I was always pretty indifferent to hunting, but I enjoyed hanging out with Dad. So, you know, I went and did it, and I had a good time. And um, one day we're at the Deer Lease, which I dearly loved because it was a place where we'd just go have a weekend with Dad and my brother, and it was just a fantastic part of my childhood was going out to the Deer Lease. One day he brings out the family handgun collection, which at the time was like two SIG 230 380s, a SIG 226, Two 1911s, a Gold Cup, and a Combat Commander, and a uh, Smith and Wesson Model 29 Dirty Harry revolver. That was the f- that was all the guns we owned back then. Handguns we owned back then. And he's like, "Try shooting handguns. It'll be fun." And I don't know what it was, but some part of my lizard brain just said, "This is your thing. You like this. This is super <laughs> cool. Do more of this." And I just fell in love with it. And I think he was just extremely excited that I was interested in something other than books or video games for the first time in my life. So he's just like, all right, yes, no, t- take him to this USBSA club. Take him to, you know, here, there, the other. And he just fully supported it because there's something athletic adjacent that I was interested in for the first time ever. And, was, you know, I had asthma growing up, so I didn't really go outside much. And uh, so I think he was just very excited about that, and he just fully supported it. So at about 14 is when I got into handguns and, like, really shooting handguns kind of semi-seriously. I ran into a guy named uh, Jim Neistat. Jim Neistat is a former uh, special operations guy. He was doing some shooting training down in the valley, uh, down in South Texas. And so I uh, got hooked up with him. They met at a party, and then said, oh, my son's into shooting. You're a shooting instructor. We should get you all together. So I did a bunch of classes with him. Ended up kind of doing a little bit of assistant instructor range monkey work for him for years. Did that for a long time. Did a couple commercial classes. Went to Gunsight back when it was in Texas, the original one. Excuse oh. me, uh, Thunder Ranch. Went to Thunder Ranch back when it was in Texas. Went to Gunsight, did 223 Carbine. Trained with Jim Smith, Spartan Tactical. Took a couple years off after that in college, just busy in college. And then in 2011, I went to grad school, and I had free time in the summers. And then I just started doing a ton of commercial firearms training from like 2011 to today. And that's been kind of my journey. And I didn't really start seriously competitive shooting to like 2019, maybe. So, And that's USPSA, what you're calling competitive shooting, right? USPSA, IDPA, Steel Challenge. Those are the, those are the big three. Um, Steel Challenge is my love language, which is weird. <laughs> that's like, like, oh, yeah, I love prog rock. That's the best rock. It's like saying that. Like, no <laughs> one accepts it except for a couple other weirdos. But I really do think Steel Challenge is my favorite. Uh, IDPA and USPSA are both fantastic. IDPA is getting a lot better. Like the IDPA of today versus the IDPA I shot like 20 years ago when I first tried it, completely different things. And the new IDPA is actually really fun. Uh, USPSA is still the gold standard for skill. That's where the most talent is. That's where the hardest matches are. Um, But also it's the one that's kind of like the most artificial in some ways too, right? Like, so there's good and bad in all of them. I would just say what's in your neighborhood what can you attend and what do you enjoy is more important than, well, this one's 1% better than that one or whatever. I, w- I wouldn't get too wrapped up around what type of match it is as much as a match is an opportunity to shoot under pressure under someone else's uh, set of standards versus you doing what you feel like you're good at at the range and then feeling good about yourself, which is much less valuable. So why do you like Steel Challenge so much? Because I've shot Steel Challenge back in the day and – I'm going to have to agree with you. I think that it out of the three, I would put USPSA or Steel Challenge at the top and USPSA second. And I think that's because, at least on my point of view, it's you know what you're walking into every time. And you can, it's like shooting a classifier every time you go, right? I think there's a couple levels to it. One, I like it in that you can bring non-expert gun people to it and they can enjoy it you can bring a 10 year old that knows basic safety and basic marksmanship and if you have a ruger 1022 with a dot on it a couple mags hey guess what they can have fun at a match the matches tend to be shorter they tend to be over you know in like three four hours they don't take as much setup there's not nearly as much pasting cleaning other stuff so it's very easy to get people into 
at the same time, any gun you own practically can be shot in it. So mm. if all you have is a 22 revolver, guess what? You can shoot. You don't own a holster, not a problem. Like, it's very adaptable, and the buy-in is much cheaper than any of the other shooting sports. Uh, but the thing I like, what you're talking about, is um, I don't look like it, but at one point I was into powerlifting. And what I liked about that is it's the same things every time, and you can measure progress over time. So if you're the kind of person that enjoys, like, let's say, baseball or something like that, kind of like a stats game, then uh, to me, you can always say, ah, I'm shooting about 90% of what I usually shoot. Ah, I shot that about, no, oh, that was a good one. And you just know your performance. It's not like... USB say or IDPA where every single one is kind of random and different. You can really dial in on how good am I getting at these things. The other thing is, uh, I think of the three sports, it's the one that resembles defensive shooting the most closely. Because the secret of SEAL Challenge is, if you want to get a fast time, you can't miss. You want five hits. There's just, you know, you add a quarter second, two tenths of a second to do a makeup shot on any of those, and guess what? You're not going to really have much of an opportunity to hit GM times, period. So if you're shooting for GM times all the time, you've just got to get five hits as fast as you possibly can. And that kind of sounds to me like civilian defensive shooting kind of situation. Low round count. You know, I don't envision it as five individual, let's say, bad guys, robots, whatever, that need shot once. I view it as a shooting problem with movement, but instead of the targets moving, I'm just transitioning Hey, this could be one target moving several places or something like that. So if you just use a little bit of imagination, which you need in, you know, IDPA and USPC also, you can make it very relevant and you can make it very uh, contextually uh, important. Now, if you have a cool RO, sometimes they'll let you in an unofficial match, let you shoot from concealment. That's how I usually shoot it. The only thing wrong with SEAL Challenge is in an official match, you can't shoot from concealment at all. It's specifically banned in the rules, which is mm. super lame. Hmm. But hopefully, you know, they've fixed that. If I, if Appendix can get an IDPA, then surely <laughs> yeah. at some point, one of us can be like, give the push we need to make Because they this. just changed that in IDPA, like, this year, didn't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think I posted the meme. It was uh, from the Watchmen, like, you're not locked in here with, you know, I'm not lock, locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. I posted that immediately when they allowed uh, <laughs> Appendix and IDPA. So, because I am one of the Appendix, kind of the second wave. I was in that second wave of guys doing it in, like, 2011. So, but, I mean, there were guys doing it before that. But I was kind of pre-mainstream, but uh, not a first wave adopter either. So, that excited me. And then you like to blend the performance base, and this you were just, I mean, you were just talking about consumer in competition shooting, and you like to blend the performance based shooting with the self defense base. I've always, since I got serious about shooting, like the context I learned it in was, you know, from, you know, uh, Jim and guys like him. It was always very, like, serious somber reality based kind of stuff and that's always kind of predicated how i thought about shooting now i view shooting kind of i don't want to do anything that's like against that makes you unuseful for self-defense or you know actual violence i don't want to learn things that will get you hurt there but at the same time i view shooting as kind of this platonic thing that i can use it for a variety of purposes for entertainment for fun for an outlet for developing success for you know self-defense however you want to look at it but um I try to always stay grounded and keep my practice as, like, this is a martial art. Like, I, t I do jiu-jitsu also, and I always tell jiu-jitsu people, like, this is what I do for exercise. My real martial art is shooting, and I, I really do look at it that way. And I think if you approach it that way, you can get a lot out of it. I don't know if you can tell, but I read The Book of Five Rings at an impressionable age, and it uh, kind of, <laughs> I don't know if it messed up my life, but it certainly changed it. How old were you? Probably about 15. Yeah, explains a lot. <laughs> Did that lead into your philosophy so master's, I, right? You got a master's in philosophy? Uh, double majored political science and philosophy undergrad. I went to a really good uh, liberal arts college and got a master's in liberal arts, which you do a little bit of everything. I did a semester of politics, society, a semester of uh, philosophy and religion, a semester of math and science, and a uh, semester of uh, history. So you do a little bit of everything, but at a very high level with really smart people, which is fun. Um, no, I think my first introduction to philosophy is one of my English teachers had me read uh, Sartre's uh, No Exit, and that got me interested in that, so I read Sartre's Being and uh, Nothingness, which is a terrible book, but it had a lot of influence on me when I was like <laughs> 17, and I kind of left it in a drawer after that, went to school, just wanted to do poli-sci, took an intro to Phil class because I had to, 
and I had an amazing professor, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nunley, the only class I ever had with him, but it had a big impact on me. And I loved that class so much. One day I was talking to Nunley after class. I was like, wait, you can get a degree in this? He's like, yes, let me bring you to the dark side. You know? <laughs> and I kind of like, I begrudgingly finished my poli sci degree after that, but I stopped caring because I was so much more interested in philosophy. Hmm. So. And then you apply that to your training. Oh, absolutely. No, like, um, so to me, philosophy is just like, conscientious problem solving like it's just saying like hey we all have filters and biases and psychological and cultural stuff kind of baked into us that's how we exist that's how we know that hey we're here talking to these three people in the room with me versus hey i'm going to stare at the bottle or whatever like that's acculturation that's you know um cultural tradition that's all sorts of things that's how your mind is kind of structured philosophy is just looking at complex problems from a more detached space and trying to like figure out what's real and what's not in a rigorous way. You know what I mean? And uh, therefore you can apply it to most anything, you know, cause I'm not, I'm not like a, you know, an analytic continental kind of guy where I'm interested in like academic philosophy. I've always been interested in like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and Simone Weil and Aristotle and Augustine and people like that who are talking about like how you live your life. They may have some like, like, oh, here's how the universe works, maybe, but I don't really care about that so much as, like, what does an examined life look like, and how do you apply yourself diligently to doing it well, you know? And to me, you can do that with shooting, you can do that with, you know, being a husband, you can do that with running a business, whatever. I mean, it's all available to you. So let's talk about you setting your sights on one specific thing and accomplishing that task. And I want to bring that up because Roger shooting school, mm -hmm. you shot it clean. The, the, t actually for those listeners who don't know what Roger shooting school is, give us a little background on Roger shooting school and the test at Roger shooting school. Yeah, so I guess there's like kind of like my stories with Rogers, and then there's like Rogers qua Rogers. Like, what is the Rogers Shooting School? <clears throat> In my opinion, for whatever that's worth, the Rogers Shooting School is the most challenging Timmy shooting test there is. It is harder than winning TACCON, it is harder than a black belt patch, it is harder than a fast coin, it is harder than a turbo pin, it is harder than any of that. And the reason for that is all those other events are like moments in time. They are, hey, you need to spike really good at this one quick thing. Mm -hmm. Rogers is a marathon. Rogers requires, for a perfect score at Rogers, requires absolute concentration and excellence through a wide variety of challenging shooting problems. Over 125 rounds fired over about 45 minutes with long breaks in between. So you can't just like, oh, hey, I did the thing really good. Or, oh, hey, I did the really... I did the thing really good twice. It's mm -hmm. you just got to be good for a long time. <laughs> and like, oh, hey, uh, I'm at the last test and I dropped one shot. Oh, another 124. Here we go. So if so, it's a pass fail test. If you're going for 125, it's yeah. just you did it or you didn't do it. Like, and so I have shot, oh man, four. I've shot, I think like seven, six, seven, 124s, which are miserable. <laughs> you don't want to do that. It's uh, the worst feeling in the world. I remember my first 124 was just awful. Like, well, I'm done doing this. It was fun. <laughs> I, I literally remember I shot the 124 and it was like one of the last tests where I dropped a point. And I just, I told Bill, Bill Rogers, I told him, I just wanted to like go walk by the creek and just cover myself with dirt <laughs> and just become one with the earth. <laughs> be like forgotten, become, become part of the landscape, you know? And uh, so the way it works is Bill Rogers is one of, I think, the unsung heroes of the training industry. Uh, very intelligent person. Um, his book is fantastic. Highly recommend everyone read it. If you go to Rogers, you get a free copy. That's the best way to get a copy of his book. And um, fantastic shooting instructor, brilliant inventor. Inventor. He invents the first, uh, like, Kydex holsters, plastic holsters. That's Bill Rogers. You have him to thank for that. No one did that before him. The whole, like, level one, two, three, Fryland, like, holster, like, security systems, like, security holsters that weren't lame, you can thank him for that, too. You know what I mean? Like, the guy's just brilliant inventor, the Rogers target system, the whole thing. Uh, really smart guy, great shooter, great instructor. He came up uh, in the FBI. He learned the Jelly Bryce point shooting that was in vogue at the time. He had a shoot-off at his place with Ken Hackathorn back in the day, and uh, 
they were about even within seven yards, seven, 10, 15 yards. But past that, Ken was smoking them because just at distance, the flash sight picture, you know, like traditional, you know, Weaver flash sight picture is just so much more powerful than point shooting that Bill, to his credit, is a man of intellectual integrity and goes, okay, yeah, up close, we're the same. But you're just better at distance. So I'm going to learn how to shoot like you and changes his whole curriculum, learns modern technique, does all that stuff. And uh, that's where you get the Roger Shooting School kind of comes up out of there. I think they had originally, they were in Florida and they moved to Georgia. They've been in Georgia for like 35 years, something like that now, I think since the 80s. Uh, but he's one of the first like facility shooting instructing places. Because remember, you had like API, which was then Gunsight, and a couple other like facilities. But Rogers is one of the oldest facility shooting schools there is. And um, the way the test looks is it's nine events with a total of 125 hits required for a perfect score over those nine events. So some of them are very short, like test one is nine shots. Some of them are very long. Test eight is um, 23 shots. So, I mean, it can be anywhere from nine to 23, and um, it just depends. They test different skills. One of the reasons that getting a perfect score Rogers is so hard is that half the test, half the tests are shot two-handed, uh, half the rounds fired are two-handed, and then about, you know, 25-30% are fired right-hand only, and about 20% are fired left-hand only, weekend only. So that weekend only shooting has culled a lot of people from advanced or 125 or whatever. And I was talking to Bill about it. I asked him, in your mind, how do you conceptualize, because there's different rankings on, you know, how well you do there, right? There's a point system that's not coming immediately to mind, but like below this is attended, and then from here to here is basic, here to here is intermediate, and then 110 or above. If you get a 110 or above any of the six times you shoot the test that week, you get an advanced rating. And an advanced rating from Rogers to me, especially shooting from concealment or duty gear, I don't care which, to me they're the same problem. Shooting concealment or duty gear and getting advanced to Rogers to me is a gold standard that you're, you're, a, you're a good defensive shooter. Like, yeah, yeah, dude, you got my back. We're cool. Like, you're good. There's no way to get that and, like, luck your way into it. You just have to be a legit shooter. Um and I think guys doing it from concealment, I only know a few that have done even have done that, have gotten the advanced from concealment. I know William April did it, he, and he did it many times. William April's dude that go to Rogers like almost every year, get a tune-up, and he'd always shoot from concealment, and he'd always get advanced because he was a really good shooter. My younger brother, Daniel, he's done it. You know, he did that this year. and uh, But it's just really hard. Um, so you have all these different gradations of skill, and I asked Bill, what do these different gradations mean? What's the difference between uh, – you know, a basic, intermediate, and advanced shooter. He goes, basic shooter, you're someone with a high level of skill shooting with both hands on the gun. Intermediate, you're someone with a high level of skill shooting both hand or dominant hand only. And then advanced, you're someone with a high level of skill shooting both hands, dominant or weak hand only. Because there's just no way you will, if you don't know how to shoot weak handed, you cannot harvest enough points to get an advanced rating. Test eight's the most rounds fired test, is 23 hits required, and it's all left hand only. So, like, if you just don't know how to shoot weekend only, you're just, you're not going to get advanced. It's just, it won't, like, it cannot happen. So, uh, it's a very well thought out test. You know, I asked him, are there things you change? He go, yeah, but, I mean, it's been, like, 35 <laughs> years. We're not changing anything. You know what I mean? Because we change it, everyone's going to get mad. <laughs> so, it's like, all right, What cool. targets are you shooting at in that? Are they B8s or are they, like, IPSC targets? They're about, most of them are about B8s. You have okay. two body targets that are, like, kind of, like, imagine like a b uh, like an ac steel maybe a little bit bigger than that and uh those are the body shots in the test if my memory serves me you'll shoot those one two three two four four eight like 11 times or the 125 if i'm remembering correctly so you have a couple where say like, oh shoot that then the head and then go here right um everything else is on eight inch uh, steel plates on pneumatic targets. So there's seven positions where head plates can pop up from uh, seven to 22 yards. Uh, so there's spots in there where you're having to left hand only transition to a 22 yard shot on an eight inch steel. And that piece <laughs> of steel is only going to be up for a second and a half. Spicy. Have so you not, have, have you not watched the Roger shooting no, test? No, I have not. Dude, go watch the Roger shoot. Yeah, I right. will put a link in the YouTube <laughs> on, on any have to wait random. Years, then. It's you, ridiculous. T test eight and test nine are the showstoppers. You want to, cause that's where it's a lot of targets and a lot of chaos and stuff. Test nine that since you're shooting two handed, the target regulations faster. So it looks more impressive cause they go down quick. Uh, test eight, there's more targets and it's impressive. You're shooting weekend only, but they stay up a little longer. Uh -huh. Right. 
So you have to be an accurate shooter to shoot well at Rogers. You have to be a fast shooter to shoot well at Rogers. Adding the complication of duty gear or uh, concealed carry gear makes it, I mean, way more complicated. And not even people think concealed carry is about the draw. The draw is not that much harder. Your reloads are just awful from appendix carry. I mean, reloading from appendix carry is just slow. Relatively speaking, I know someone's going to call me out, but like it's just it's harder, bro. It's just harder. IDPA <laughs> reloads are easier. The vest makes it easier. And um, but it's just an incredibly challenging shooting test uh it's it's a marathon you can't relax um and there's just you can't be weak at anything and you have to be mentally present and performing at a high level the whole time there's no whoopsie like there's just you just gotta bring it and it's really hard spicy it it really is spicy yeah i'll I'll, I'll do some homework tonight yeah we need a link to that video or a video one of the yeah it's it's quite interesting and uh, since it was one of the original established shooting schools, like you talked to some of the older older guys that were in in Delta or SF or SEALs, like that is one of the schools that they would send them to. That Mid South, you know, they were. All, I mean, that is like an OG shooting school, and it was it was really cool to to listen to you. I think uh, Ballistic Radio, you were talking about it on oh, yeah. there, and you were. In the process of training up to go, yeah, I think it's either just on the way or on the way back. I mean, because so the thing for me is Rogers. So it's a super challenging test, but it's not just that; it's a shooting school. You're learning how to shoot. You're getting to talk to Bill and his cadre. He's got a lot of good guys. They're all military XSF guys. They're really good people. And um, the first time I was supposed to go was in 2012 or 13. I was supposed to go, but I got injured in ECQC the week before, <laughs> which, you know, is not ideal. And uh, so I was in a sling. And so I figured, well, there's not a lot of one-hand shooting, but I don't think I can do this all as one-handed shooting. So I had to bail. So my brother and my friend uh, Vu went. And then um, I went for the first time, I want to say, 2015, 2016. And I went blind. I intentionally did not study the test. I was being very much Book of Five Rings, you know, like nerd Ronin thing. I just wanted to test my <laughs> skill. You know, and so I intentionally did not study it. And um, the first time they ran the target system, I was just like, how is this possible? And, <laughs> and I mean, I was a pretty good shooter at that point. But I mean, I was very like, how is this a thing that people do? Like, this seems too fast. Like, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. And uh, that first trip, I did pretty good. My low score, my low score for the week was my first score, which was a 105, which is five points shy of an advanced. And then my high of that week was a 121 and uh so four down and uh i won the red pin so the best guy in class is the red pin but no you're exactly right that's one of the cool things about the school is you can talk to guys from 20 years ago oh i know rogers oh i've done that test but the weird thing is it's so like military le oriented because so many places they'll just do private classes out there that i feel like the word just hasn't gotten out to like the regular Timmy bro like population is people are, like coming up with these crazy shooting tests and stuff. I'm like, guys, just go to Rogers. Like, just go to Rogers. Where, you know? where is it? It's in LJ, Georgia. Okay. I think in the fall they have an Apple Festival. I was there for that one year. It was fun. Oh, huh. I recommend doing that. Yeah, it, was all right. <laughs> it is Georgia hot in the summer. I've been there in every season. It oh. is uh, cold, cold. It's in the mountains. It's proper cold <laughs> in the winter. It is proper hot in the summer. Uh, you know, fall's not a bad time to be there, in my opinion. But uh, no, they've been there a long time. Interesting. Yeah, I can't believe you've never. I mean, I've heard of it. I've just never like YouTubed it. Yeah, YouTubed it a couple times. It's it's quite interesting. And William would was always talking about it. uh, In in his that was his I think one of his highlights of his year was to go to go to Rogers and shoot. Same here. I've got a cadre of buddies that uh, you know like the. You know, it's like it's like the Avengers, you know, the roster changes. But, like, we got a core group of guys that we try to go about every year, every other year for the last, like, five, six years. And some years we miss it, you know, during 2020 or whatever, you know, just couldn't pull it off. But, like, we go every year, and it's more of like, hey, it's a, guy, you know, it's a guy's trip. It's a bunch of gun bros doing gun bro stuff. We'll rent a cabin or whatever. Back then you had the cabin on site, whereas all 18 students were invited to stay at, at Bill's place, right, this little cabin. They cook breakfast in the morning. You oh, get nice. story time with Bill. 
every now and then you get like one time we were there and I'm just sitting on the couch, like on my phone and I see super Dave Harrington walk in and I'm just like, <laughs> well, that's uh, interesting. He's like, hello gentlemen. And he just like sits down on the couch and sleeps. <laughs> that's, that's... And I'm there looking at like, Oh wow. What, what's this? And my friend's like, what's going on? Who's that guy? I'm like, that's super Dave Harrington, bro. That's like, that's, that's the guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> so just fun things like that would happen. People would just appear. Right. And cause it's, you know, it's Bill Rogers, Rogers shooting school. And, um, but me and my friends now that he no longer has the cabin, you just have to stay at, you know, uh, get in a nice Airbnb or whatever. So now we get our own cabin and we just go and it's like, like a fun guy's trip. But at the same time, what I like about it is, so you got guys like me in our group, they're shooting for perfect scores and you got other guys that are like, oh man, I got to get that basic. And it doesn't matter. There's something there for the whole crew. Like whether you're trying to get basic or whether you're trying to, you know, get multiple 125s in a week, it's there. And so that's what's fun about it is it's so scalable. Because, like, if you're an advanced shooter and you've got a buddy that's more of a beginner, you don't really want to go to the beginner class with him. And, hey, I want you to come to advanced shooting 205, you know, underwater, basket weaving, shooting, repelling from a <laughs> helicopter, whatever. That beginner guy, he doesn't want to go to that. Now, Rogers is not a beginner school. You need to have safe gun handling. You need to be accurate. You need to be able to hit a plate at 22 yards. I mean, there's a certain level of skill. You just need to enjoy your time there. But within that kind of realm of, like, competent shooter to, like, advanced shooter, there's something there for everybody. And that's what's so cool about it. I don't just have to get, like, five or six guys or super advanced guys to go. I just got to get five or six intermediate to advanced guys, and we can all get something out of it as a group. And you have the advanced guys coaching, like, the guys trying to get basic, and, like, it's – I don't know. It's a fun experience. What are you normally uh, shooting when you go there? I started shooting stock Glock 34s because that's what I shot back then. (laughs) Uh I mean, I, they had good sights on them. They had Dawson sights, but, like, really just stock 34s was – I shot that – my first two Tacon wins and my first third were all stock 34s. They were not anything <laughs> odd, just stock 34s from junk carry because that's just a good gun, you know what I mean? I, a Man on Fire is a good film. It inspired me, so, you know, like, <laughs> right? And uh, I was just like, well, it comes with a minus connector, so I don't have to buy one, so I'll take that instead of 17. Like, that, that's <laughs> the amount of thought <laughs> that went into it. But – um. Actually, my first Rogers, my gun I was going to shoot, my 17 I was going to shoot broke. So I ended up, like, having to go through the bag of guns to, like, get a gun that worked. Because I brought a 34, I realized I didn't have an appendix holster for a 34. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do shoot 3 o'clock for this. I don't know. So I shot a uh, Glock 17 with a plus minus New York, tra- uh, New York spring with a minus <laughs> connector on it. That's the one I got the 121 with. <laughs> And then I shot with an M&P once because I oh, should try the M&P. I'm like, oh, no, this is the, it's the grip angle is different. It's a fine gun, but it's just not. I should not be trying a new gun right now. And uh, so the first one was a total mess. Um, after that, 34s. And then my last two trips have been with, like, bore-sided out 17s with uh, SROs on them. And that's where I had, you know, the best luck, right? You know, because, I mean, having a gun, you're not fighting absolutely helps and my vision's deteriorating enough where the dot gives me a little bit easier work with an irons especially like the 22 yard kind of stuff up close i shoot irons just as good but past like 15 yards the dot is helpful for just my eyesight have you shot it with the your brace of staccatos yet if i can make it next year because i got a lot of just stuff going on in my life i got ankle surgery coming up and a bunch of other stuff uh if i can make it there next year that's the plan because i've been shooting staccatos last i mean i haven't been shooting seriously the last couple of months but to the extent i have been i've been kind of going back into the uh single action life because like everyone of my vintage i came up you know shooting because i started shooting seriously in the year 2000 so i came up on 1911s that's what you did right and uh so i shot colt combat commander forever i got ragged out combat commander and like Colt 1911s and stuff and uh ended up with a Wilson I have a ragged out Wilson CQB because it's just it's falling apart you know what I mean and um but you know that's what I came up on I only switched to Glocks reluctantly I was I was the worst like dumb gun guy Timmy stereotype you could imagine I believe competition is going to get you killed in the streets I believe they all fall to hardball. I believe, ah, oh, no, Tupperware gun. You need a man's gun. You need steel. <laughs> I was like that walking gun store. Like, like <laughs> all that is wrong with, like, the beef jerky smell and, like, disdainful <laughs> glare of, like, a bad gun store. I was that guy, right? 
So there is hope for your friends like that. I want to point that out. They can go from there to here. <laughs> like, it, like that change is possible, but only through extreme intervention and personal growth and acceptance <laughs> of vulnerability. Maybe have your friends re- listen to some Brene Brown first, and then you can start opening them up to new life experiences. It's funny because you can like, I don't want to say you can go into a gun store and judge how it is by like what they're carrying, but you can like 100% do that. If like you go in and they're all like outside the waistband, you know, 1911s or who knows what you're like, this is going to be an interesting experience. There's still a lot of gun stores that are time capsules, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. we, we broke into a time capsule about two years ago, <laughs> didn't we? I need to know about this. I, I'm curious. Oh, no, the, the range across. When, <gasps> when you, when you open oh, up the when, new spot, yeah. When, when Ike purchased BTO Range and Training Center, when we walked in the door, it was like stepping back into like 1940s gun. When you walked in, do they hand you, like, nylon holsters with Ruger P89s in them? Yeah. Like, Here you go, sir. These are yours now. They had the, the, thank issue. you. They had the full collection of Winchester, like, what what kind of art was it? Like the, Oh, so, the, like, you know, like, those old tin signs that you'd have? Oh, yeah, yeah. We had a, there's just, actually, we, we put them all in a box. I'm saving a bunch of them. But they had a bunch of, the, like, those old Winchester tin signs and, like, old ammo shotgun shell boxes and stuff. And, like, the little cardboard, um, you know, without the plastic inserts, like, little cartridge cases. Mm-hmm. Um, like 32 um, caliber stuff. Oh, cool. A lot of old. I, I got a bunch of that. It's all in a box. Well, see, so that's like all the way back to being hipster again, though. The yeah, I know. caliber. Like, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Just, just leave it up there. <laughs> sit, sit around. It'll, it'll, it'll kind of come it's back. It's so square. It's hip. You yeah. Know? Like, <laughs> I get it. That's cool. No. So I don't even hate that gun store experience, but I'm really happy that places like y'all's exist. Like, I remember the first time I walked into BTO, I was just like, oh my God, like, grown-ups are here this is this is a place this is a gun store i want to be in which you know usually is just for like anthropological curiosity is when i go into a gun store but but y'all's is actually nice you know you have things i want to purchase which is very odd for me in you know a typical gun store i like it for the compliment i like going into into gun stores and seeing what they have though because you like a you might find something hella cool yes and b you might see something and learn something <laughs> i like i like going to the used sections of yeah oh too. absolutely yes. you always find like even like pawn shops and stuff i loved used to love going to pawn shops just seeing like what they'd have you know like you find some old colt revolvers or this oh, you that's know. why i love going to uh collectors every oh, now and God. then you pop into collectors and you're like well i'm gonna be here for the next three hours because it's basically a history museum of guns yeah. See, in that I, place I, one thing i really like about like the whole like being a gun guy or whatever i really like the history of a lot of the guns mm-hmm. you know like um, just, I mean, there's such a rich history across so many different aspects of it, oh, but yeah. just, just the historical aspect of it, I think is kind of cool. And especially like the used guns, you're like, oh, there's an old Colt detective special. I wonder who, like, who carried this? Who yeah. was this before I'm buying it? Yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah. That's, it's always, it's always cool to see yeah, something. Yeah. Ellie buys, you know, where, where somebody's bought out a department and it's all their old revolvers or all their old their old pistols and you get that one that's just been you know Ran the crusty old sergeant carried it and it's been out of the holster you know just everything's wore off of it the finish is gone and it just you can like, like all right this guy didn't work a, with this yeah there's a personality there's, <laughs> a, there's some bodies on that thing you i know, like it it's always it's always cool oh back to specifics and back to specifics on on the training so you also got your fast coin and did you get that direct from so i shot for my first fast coin i want to say 12 12 or 13 it was actually turned out to be one of todd green's last classes um one of his very last classes i think he only did a couple i was signed up to do a follow-up like i wanted to make another run for it but, um, and I just really enjoyed Todd's training. I mean, he, yeah. he's a guy, he was a very smart guy and he was really ahead of the curve on the performance shooting for concealed carry thing. He was one of the, like the first guys really pushing that. And to my knowledge, you know, there may be people I don't know about, but, um, but he got sick. Right. And so I didn't get yeah. the opportunity because like I said, my first time with Rogers, my first time I went to aim fast, hit fast. Uh, I just went in blind. I was like, well, they tell me this Todd green guy is really good. I'm going to go do that. I've read pistol for him a few times, you know, <laughs> let's, let's go. And uh, so I shot it with my carry gun at the time, which is a Glock 26. So I'm Oof. shooting it with a Glock 26. Oof. <laughs> Oof. I, I got a 525, so I almost, I almost got the opportunity to get in the lightning round because you've got to do it twice to get the coin. But I was a quarter second shy of, uh, of getting, having the opportunity to get it the sec- 
to try it for the second time and maybe get a coin. So if I had known this would be my only opportunity to get one with Todd, like, yeah, I would have brought a 17 or something. But that just, you know, I was trying to be book of fight, you know, Musashi about it. And uh, so then I shot for it again uh, in 17. Again, I didn't study for it, practice or anything. I was just wanted to go to Ernie Langdon's class. And he was like, oh, yeah, fast going. Let me try for that. Ah, it didn't happen. But then this year in 21, uh, not this year, last year in 21, you know, I got my second black belt patch with Scott Jedlinski in February. And then I went double gold to TACCON in March. And I had Rogers coming up, and I was going to gun for a 125 of Rogers, which I had not done to that point. I got a bunch of 124s, but no 125s, always a bridesmaid. And I got three 125s in a week. Uh, I only got to shoot it five times. I had to go home before I could shoot the sixth test. But uh, I dropped two shots and five attempts. And um, so then I was looking at myself going, well, man, that's a lot in one year. What else can I do this year? I was like, the fast coin. I need to go get my fast coin. So this time I studied for it. And uh, so I went and I got my fast coin with Ernie in Dallas. And um, then I was like, man, what else? I mean, one year, dang. And so I called up Gabe White, did a private with y'all. Yeah. Had him come to here to Conroe with you guys because it was like a happy medium. And, uh, you know, I shot for a turbo, my second turbo pin with him and uh, got that too. So I was able to just kind of like line up to me, the big five all in one year. And that was pretty cool. It's crazy. Don't recommend it. Never going to do it again. But, you know, <laughs> it was it was fun. That's, that's so for, spicy. So for those that may not know, what what is what goes into the fast coin? Can you give a so, quick so the fast coin, um, fundamental assessment of skills and something, uh, fast, fast test. Uh, it's, a, it's a test, not a drill, because there's a distinction. It's a test that Todd Lewis Green came up with. It's basically, you know, kind of like an assessment of, you know, how good of a practical defensive shooter from concealment are you, right? So what it entails is a set shot from seven yards. There's, you know, various penalties and math you can do, whether you're open carrying, concealed carrying, carrying from retention holster. You know, he's got different math, so add time, subtract time, whatever. But basically, you're drawing to one target at seven yards. There's no movement. You put two rounds in an eye box, slide lock reload, and then four rounds into an eight-inch uh, chest circle, right? The time to beat is uh, five seconds, so and it's f five or down. So you have to bang, bang, reload, bang, 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 bang. And then they all got to be in the index card or in the eight-inch circle. You then have to do it again. Like, it's not a one and done. Like, hey, you did the thing. It's like you got to do it twice in a row. So then you do it the second time. Once you get the second time, you get your coin. It's, uh, I mean, Todd was very vocal about this is not something you should just do a thousand times yeah. to get ready for it. Because that's not, it's not, you're doing too much to, for it to be worth just, you know, going to like a Zen state and doing for an hour. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a good thing for that. I think Todd was right. Because you're doing, you know, draw to, draw to a precise target a slide lock reload, and then you're doing, you know, follow-up from the slide lock reload, four shots at a easier target, right? So there's a lot of different things going on, and if I'm going to do something, I'm just trying to grind my way through. I'd rather break into component parts. And so that's what I did when I studied for uh, the fast test, when I just tried to really make sure I understood it and what I was doing, was I broke it down to the pieces. What is it? It's draw to the eye box, it's slide lock reload, and then it's four shots off slide lock reload. How do I get to where I can do that consistently? And uh, so I found a lot of value in breaking down the component pieces and then repping those a lot. But I didn't actually practice the whole thing that much. Really just like the night before uh, in dry fires when I really kind of put it together. And I would like diagnostic test myself when I go to the range. Like, okay, I'm, where am I hitting most of the time? Am I consistently hitting it? Am I getting close? Whatever. Because you're going to dip like when you're under pressure, you're going to do about 10% worse than you do at your home range, right? So I just had a math. I had to be, like, consistently 10 15% better to be able to, like, okay, with stress and people watching, you're just going to shoot worse. And uh, that's kind of how I prepped for it. I didn't just do the fast drill, like, a million times in my basement or anything. I, I don't think that's productive. And that's usually how you get better at something, right? You break it down to its individual components. Like, if you're trying to, like – practice your draw or something you're not practicing the whole draw you're practicing first cover clear the cover garment mm -hmm. practice getting the good grip on the gun practice coming from here to here here to there presentation and all that and if, is that how you approach it or how do you it, I, i've heard i'm not that smart right <laughs> not in this at least uh i i like standing on the shoulders of giants kind of thing like the guy really set a lot of my views on how you prep 
like for specific skills and how you like grow specific skills is uh, uh ben stoger i mean ben ben stoger I've, i train with him almost every year and uh, i've read all his books you know <laughs> repeatedly i haven't read the new rifle one yet i'm pretty agnostic on rifles so like, <laughs> once a year i'm like yeah it's still I still know how to shoot a rifle, and then I can't put it back in the safe. <laughs> Check the zero, remind myself I know how to shoot a rifle, and then I forget about it. You know. Um, You're like, rifle, rifle, where did I put that thing? Hmm, zombies out yet? <laughs> nope. Don't really care about the rifle. You know, it's kind of where it's at. And um, so his approach, I mean, really, you look at, like, since I've been paying attention, you know, like, semi-seriously the last 10, 15 years, the state of play in USPSA has just gone whoop. Like guys are like, like, oh, I was a USPSA GM like 20 years ago. It's like you're like A class now, buddy. Like, <laughs> like that's just what it is, and that's just because the equipment's better, the the guys are better. I mean, the internet changed USPSA because it used to be you had to like get some GM mentor. You'd have mm -hmm. to find one of these like gods of competitive shooting, and if you're lucky, he liked you and he gave you some tips, or you went to a shooting class, or you read a book, right? Now there's like forums and, you know, video on demand. You can send your videos to world champs. Yeah, video diagnostics and stuff. Yeah, like Scott does that. You can get so good in your basement now that it's crazy. And so like Ben, my understanding of Ben's story, if I'm wrong, you know, forgive me, is that he essentially decided I want to get really good at competitive shooting and went into his basement and he broke everything down in component parts. And then he emerged like, yeah. like <laughs> a sword saint god of USPSA and then just like, destroyed just everyone destroyed yeah. production division for the better part of a decade right and ba that's back when production was where the heat was because that's another thing too is you gotta look at what division someone's shooting because there are divisions that like nobody's in there's divisions that like you do good at carry optics now like you're the guy because carry optics is everybody's in carry optics right like you're competing against a lot of people and uh so ben's approach of like being very granular and kind of like you know i talked to gabe white about this uh gabe's i consider him a friend he's fantastic person i really like gave a lot we were talking about our differing approaches for how we personally prepared for rogers by the time i started really preparing for it and then like what's more impressive about what gabe did is he got a 125 his first trip right that that's something i didn't get right and uh it's because gabe's really good <laughs> and uh but also you know um gabe's approach was very much like replicating the Rogers shooting test in dry fire and live fire the best you can without a Rogers range and really dialing in like, Hey, I want to know this thing. My approach is more generalist. I want to have a robust set of skills and then I want to run through simulations of the test or like approximations of the test enough to kind of like, Ooh, what, what's not working. Okay. I'll go back, work on that. Clearly both approaches work. His work for getting a 125 out of the gate, Mine work for getting three 125s out of five, right? Five attempts. They're both valid. They both have pros and cons. I think a lot of it is you will need to learn what works for you. And that's a very unsatisfying answer. I could be like, Gabe's wrong. I'm right. Or like, I'm wrong. Gabe's right. I mean, whatever. I don't think either of us are wrong. I think he's a super smart guy. And he came up with an approach that super works for him. And I'm a reasonably smart guy. that figured out after a bunch of attempts and go, oh, I think this is the way I prep for this. And, you know, kind of stole some of Ben's ideas. And uh, both can work. How much are you shooting? Like last year when you got, what, five five different things? Like yeah. Well, how much were you practicing? How much were you shooting? How much were you dry firing? Leading up, like, so what I, and this is something I learned from Ben too, because I shot with Ben that February, right after I got the second black belt patch. Um, I, I, t I took Ben's class, and I was talking to him just, you know, because he knows me because I go shoot with him every year. And, um... I was asking him, how do you, like, match day? Like, how do you, what is your match prep? Like, and he's like, well, how much can you shoot? And they're like, well, I'll usually be shooting, like, you know, like, twice a day for the weeks leading up to it. And I'm like, hold up. Okay. <laughs> There's, first of all, no scenario where I get to shoot more than twice a week. Like, none. And one of those will be, like, a club match, USBSA match, and one will be a practice session. And I'm too busy with work. That is best case scenario what's going to happen. And Ben just looks at me and goes, oh, it's going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was Ben's reaction. Good like, luck. Well, good luck, young son. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, like in 21, I'd, I'd venture to say I probably shot in the 20,000 round mark. You know, I shot a lot. in 20, That's a lot for me. You know, I think the most I ever shot in a year is maybe 25, you know, something. I mean, because one, it's a lot of money, right? Yeah, yeah. Two, it's a lot of time. 
And, um, but I've had years or years, you know, like when I won the first, my first tack on in 16, I think I shot maybe 5,000 rounds that year. So, I mean, it just, if you have the time and the ammo and the discipline, yes, do it. You, you'll probably help. Uh, I often lack all three. <laughs> so it's what's just, your ratio of like dry fire to live fire? Ideally, like 10 to one, if I could, you know, if I just, that's what I think dry fire is more important than live fire works, for like me. And how I process things and how my brain works. Heard that a lot. Might be a clue. Uh, it's it's dry fire is the real real. I think the reason because like my first real major shooting accomplishment was my expert ticket at gun sight in 2010. I've been shooting for a decade before that, and I was always pretty good. I go to a little I go to a Timmy class or whatever, and I'd be one of the better guys, or you know I was fine. And the reason I got to the skill level where I could at least do that was just re like relentless dry fire. And the way I dry fire is I dry fire. Kind of like how uh, Dave Harrington dry fires. I'm much more just kind of like Zen state rote motions, just doing the same thing over and over and over. Not the kind of like, hey, I'm going to simulate stages like how Ben Steger does it. So that that was a dry fire I came up on. Now I mix it up a little bit between the two. But at that time, at that kind of primitive phase in my training and preparation, I was very much like I would just put on like I put – uh, the movie, you know, Guy Ritchie movie Snatch on the TV, and I, for an hour and a half, I would just do reloads, and there I am watching Snatch, just doing reloads until, like, I'm just drenched in sweat, my arms are tired, and you just switch to something else when your hands are too tired to keep doing what you're doing, and you do something else. Yeah, practice that's kind of what I would do permanent. every like, day. Yeah, you, you know what I mean? I'd only shot, hard. like, yeah. once every other exactly. week back then, right? But, you know, you can dry fire as much as you feel like, right? Um, the other thing is most people dry fire wrong, in my opinion. If you can just dry fire for an hour and a half and not be a sweaty, tired, like inflamed mess, you're not gripping the gun hard enough, you're not pulling the trigger hard enough, you're not presenting fast enough, you're kind of kidding yourself. And in fact, oftentimes, if you dry fire wrong, you're making yourself worse at shooting. You're learning how to shoot wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, you're doing yourself like they did Wimp Low. They're training you wrong is a joke. Like, don't, don't do it. Like, that's not what you want. What you need is I'd rather have, like, 15 minutes of really good dry fire than, like, two hours of, like – because the thing is, if you practice – because to me, the technical skill of shooting, other than marksmanship and, I guess you could argue safety, that matters most is draw to first shot because it doesn't matter how good a shooter you are. If your gun stays in the holster the entire fight, you, you lose, right? Mm -hmm. So – if you draw and you're not drawing at the right speed, you're never going to learn how to like land the sights where you want them at, at full extension. The other thing that's not going to happen is if you're not gripping tight enough, um, you're basically teaching yourself to like do you know grip induced shooting errors, whether that's you know milking or jerking the trigger or whatever, however you want to frame it. But essentially, most people don't miss because their sights are off. Most people miss because as they are triggering, they do something dumb, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm them. I'm us. This is me I'm talking about. You know, I don't mean that pejoratively. I'm in this club also. But, like, if you're training yourself to, well, I'm kind of grabbing it, and then when I'm shooting, I grab it tighter because it comes out of my hand, so i got to hold it a little different. All those reps you did of just not grabbing it tight enough did not help you. In fact, that's telling your brain, hey, there's all sorts of ways you can grab the gun, which is, like, not really what you want, I don't think. So... You have to do it with intentionality. I don't mind mindless dry fire. I'm, I still do mindless dry fire. That's where I use a cert. I think a cert is really good for mindless dry fire. Like now, if I were watching a movie and dry firing, it would, it's only with a cert. It's not with like a real, you know, like an unloaded gun or anything. It's just with a cert pistol. Because you can practice reloads with a cert and triggering. And you can practice presentations with a cert and that kind of stuff. And you can be very easygoing with it. Uh, when you're dry firing with real guns, that's where I'm doing like more technical stuff, more like Ben Steger kind of stuff, where I want the gun to be a direct analog. Like, it will be the gun I plan on shooting or, you know, clone of it. So You talked about the, you know, Gabe White and his, his turbo pin. Mm -hmm. Break that down. What's what's that look like, and how did you prepare for it? So the first time I just went in, I want to train with Gabe White. I don't know what this <laughs> is. Just show up. Gabe White's supposed to be really good. I I, you know, his old uh, online pseudonym, like Origami AK. I read Origami yeah. AK's posts on, you know, for sure pistol forum. I think he was on TPI back in the day. That's something like current gen gun bros don't remember is the forums. Yeah. <laughs> and the forums were just, like, awesome. 50% how, how, of this room doesn't remember TPI. So oh. Yo, You were never on TPI, right? I was not. What's <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's so, TPI? 
So the League of Shadows without the political agenda is basically uh, like TPI, TPI gotcha. search. Uh, whatever. No, that, that was Craig and Paul Sharp and the Shipworks Collective. That was their forum back in the day. And like, dude, like. What are forums? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like Facebook, but everyone has like like pictures of characters from TV shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. has their profile face. picture. Has their avatar. Yeah. yeah, it kind of predated the anime <laughs> profile pic, you know, the, the problematic <laughs> anime <laughs> profile pic. But uh, no, TP, so like. That's another thing. Okay, this actually, let's just go on a side topic. Speaking of things like these youngsters don't remember, says a 36-year-old, is uh, I remember coming up, like, reading, like, going to Barnes & Nobles and just, I'm going to read every gun magazine. In, I'm not going to buy any of them. I'm going to read every gun magazine in here. You know what I mean? And I did buy them. Don't worry. I bought SWAT because they deserved it. But um, so I would just go and read gun magazines and, like, gun magazines. I mean, you have good ones now, like Recoil and stuff like that. But, like, back in the day, like, are you going to go train with Ken Hackathorn? He's teaching like five classes this year. Good luck. Or you can read his article. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so a lot of knowledge was transmitted back then through magazines. And that's something that just people, you know, unless you have a big stack of old gun magazines, like a lot of that knowledge is, it's very ephemeral. It's like a Facebook post. It kind of, it's gone. When it's gone, it's, it's gone unless you really go searching. Right. So I remember those days and, you know, there was so much, I'm not going to name names, but there was so much dubious content in the uh, in gun magazines. You know what I mean? You're thinking like, well, of course I need a Korth revolver and a you know <laughs> bank deposit box with you know like like a spare passport. Like the, this <laughs> this is going to come up. And you'd read stuff and they're talking about like, okay, you need a Sig 210 for precision, but then you also have a Stetchkin for close up engagements. Like these, <laughs> these people writing about things that didn't make any sense, and it was just wonderful. It was just beautifully derpy and i miss it there are also so many wonderful like nuggets of gold and so many really cool people writing and getting stuff out there you know that it was just a really cool interesting time so it's kind of like i remember that you know all they've always been shooting books you know masayub uh guns digest book of combat hand gunnery i forget which edition it was but it was his first edition chuck taylor wrote the edition before that but Moss's first version of that was one of the my bibles back in the day you know what i mean but yeah, guys, don't understand. Now it's all on YouTube. Now it's all on Instagram. But and which is good. It has its own advantages because like video is a very helpful medium for a lot of this stuff. But man, the the forum days and mm-hmm. the the magazine days and not knowing who was completely making it up and who was like, no, this is an actual expert here telling you like you should probably listen to him, not Rando McRanderson over here. Yeah. Like having to parse that information, that the information literacy you had to develop to not just turn into a giant ball of dirt like I was when I started. You know, I'll I'll fall to hardball guy. If you don't want to be him, you got to really pay attention. And uh, it was kind of fun, though, in its own Wild West kind of way. The forums were really cool. That's how I got into the training industry and got into firearms was the, was was actually uh, zombiehunters.org. If you're ready for zombies, <laughs> you're ready for anything, yes. right? And that there was a series, like the two biggest parts of that was like survival preparedness, but the firearms forum was deep. And it wasn't just like, oh, 1022 tw- is like the ultimate zombie. It was like, this is who is training. This is, and that led to TPI and that led to pistolforum.com. And then all of a sudden you realize that this guy, well, that's the same username that's over here in this forum. And that's the same username that's over here in this. And, oh, now we're all going to meet up and go train at, um, like, we were on m4carbing.net. And that's how I met. Half the dudes that I went to the fork, my first open enrollment class was on a forum. And you didn't, we didn't have Facebooks then because, well, none of us were in college, you know, so we couldn't have Facebook. Yeah. And, but like we went and that was like the first time seeing a dude that you knew from their little anime character on forum right and we probably ran into each other on tpi i'm sorry. way back in the I, day. I was a lurker on tpi yeah i didn't like, post i just read because well, gabe white would post the videos on there you got craig and paul sharp gabe white talking no oh, i don't yeah. you don't need it's my like, opinion what are you gonna here. add yeah. yeah you don't need me I have po- no value here yeah especially like 2010 me you don't need, need no, me polluting nothing. this stream i'm just here to you know like take it all in it was like know? uh i remember when somebody first added me to the pns group and they were mm-hmm. like hey don't don't fucking say anything. say anything just read because like yeah. you're yeah. dumb and like you're dumb so just read and i was like okay and then you start reading and you're like oh i am dumb i am kind yeah of like, like you're like oh, <laughs> oh yeah. i have a lot to to read on i mean that that was years ago for me and it was like oh okay i mean it was gotcha. it was to the point there i mean there were there were posts where you were 
you would be interacting with somebody and they're like, you know, post post a video or post a post a shot of the time your shot timer. And then somebody's like, Well, I don't have a shot timer and then like, everybody's like, Just go away, dude. Like just <laughs> No more please. No, don't don't post anything. How can you Like you know. I, I really think like the gun forums thing could have been solved where like when you're signing up for memberships, like a click if you're not a robot, all right, upload a picture of your face with a shot timer. <laughs> like if that was a requirement for setting up an account, I think like the noise ratio would be fantastic. So it was it was a fun time. It was a fun time. And now, you know, fifteen years later you find out that like there's certain companies that actually own those forums. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, so that's why all that information on that certain forum pointed back to Brown Ells. Oh, they just recently bought it. Oh really? Was yeah. that is that a recent thing? Yeah, within the past couple of years I think. Uh, for AR fifteen dot com? Yeah. yeah. Arfcom. Yeah. yeah, that was a recent, pretty sure it was within the past couple of years. Okay. I mean, like, my personal training journey, like, I don't, I never get to ECQC or Rogers unless I get to Tactical Response, and I got to Tactical Response by being a member of Get Off The X forums, yep. right? So I was on Get Off The X, and I was, so there's so many cool OGs that are, like, people don't even realize are OGs. Like, I'm going to shout out to my brother through another mother. He's going through some personal stuff right now, uh, death in the family, but Mark Lowell. A guy I love, uh, you know, uh, growing up guns. I would read his posts and get off the X back in 2010 and be like, man, this guy's doing Muay Thai and shooting and jujitsu. Man, that sounds crazy. That's awesome. You know what I mean? And I was looking at that like, like he was some kind of alien, like Ubermensch kind of thing. And, uh, you know, you'd run into these trailblazing, super cool guys who are doing stuff that's now like, well, of course you do that. Whereas 10 years ago, you were from Mars if you're doing <laughs> stuff like that. And, um, you know, and uh, so I go to my first uh, tad response class, and who's my instructor? Paul Gomez is my instructor. Oh, nice. So I started talking to Paul Gomez, and me and Gomez started to get friendly, and, you know, so I keep going back to train with Paul, and everyone else there is cool too, but, you know, I especially bonded with Paul. Then when he went off and did his own thing, I followed him, and so I'd always ask Paul, like, hey, who, who do I train with? Who are the other really good people? You know, because first time I met Paul, he's he's got uh, – back then he was carrying 3 o'clock, but he showed me a appendix carrier, and he was carrying a knife forward to the hips, like a little TD, little TDI bendy knife. And, uh, you know, he's showing me this, like, retention, grounded stuff, like knife employment from, you know, grounded grapple. And this is all stuff that's, like, whew, way over my head. And uh, But I thought it was cool, so I asked him, where do I need to go? He's like, well, you need to go to Rogers, and you need to go to ECQC. I was like, okay. And so it all kind of takes off from there which I never get to without Paul, which I never get to without a forum, a gun forum. You know what I mean? I would never have known to do any of that stuff. Yeah. I wonder what, what the journey looks like these days on that. Is that they find it on on Instagram and then they start following them on Instagram and then oh, it, no. Yeah, because it's totally different. Like, so the, you know, the internet and forums kind of changed everything. I, I wonder how Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Reels and TikTok and all that's kind of changing the... The, uh, the journey now. Well, we now know that we've, like, 1.8 million people have been introduced to Bill, Bill Blowers. Blowers via our shorts on YouTube. And, you know, it's it's funny reading the comments on there because half the people are like, holy fuck, what is this guy talking about? You know, or calm down. Yeah. And then the other people are like, I love this man. Who is he? Yeah. And where, where can I, I train more? with him? Well, you know? I mean, like, a weird side but like my journey in the shooting community and industry has really been since I've moved to Texas. So my first year here, you know, I, I, when I got the job at the range is when I really started shooting. And that was this point okay. four years ago. So I mean, like, I owned, you know, a couple well, of rifles and like shotguns at home, but you know, it was like, Hey, let's go throw some clay pigeons in and shoot some guns. So it's like, I've really only been, training for really two three years and, and that's like my so like the internet like i've been in pns for a while just reading and learning but to like my first class really was like taking one of yours at the range and that's like my first time really like getting some solid education and shooting to a standard and not just like, all right, we're going to the range. Let's go shoot some guns and, and shoot see what happens. Cans. Yeah. So it's like, I'm 30, I'm going to be 33. Mm -hmm. You just said you're 36. So it's like, okay, we're really not that far off in age. I mean, you're 30, 30, 
31. 30, 30, yes. 30, 30. 30, 30, 30 31. <laughs> and, but, like, you've been shooting probably a decade longer than – than I have when yeah, it I think comes probably to 12 or 13 is when I started like venturing off and then 14, 15 is when I really started hitting. Yeah. Hard. So, I mean, you, you have eight years on me. You have, well, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm 36 with 22 years experience shooting relatively, but yeah. there are years in there. I didn't shoot at all. So don't, yeah. like, in, like in school and stuff, there are years where I just, I didn't really touch When did guy. you shoot your first, I mean, USPSA match? When I was 14. Yeah. yeah. Like I've, <laughs> Yeah, never even heard of USPSA <laughs> until I moved to Texas. Yeah. yeah, and there was a post on on Facebook the other day. They were talking about somebody who hosted Craig, mm -hmm. and their fourteen year old <gasps> yes. kid went through ECQC. I'm like, can you imagine getting like exposed to that? No, when you were. You know, there, there's two. You're either going to be a super criminal, <laughs> like, like yes. you're going to be able to kick everybody's ass, or you're going to be a very well-rounded, self-protection, well-prepared dude. Yeah. And uh, I've always joked with Craig that you know if he ends up retiring before my two daughters are old enough to take EWO or ECQC, that he's going to come out of retirement for the class. He's like, absolutely, do a absolutely, class. yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And that's, I, I think... Uh, the girls can just kick the shit out of each yeah. other in the class. Yeah. <laughs> Put on these helmets. I mean, the, uh, what better way of introducing uh, somebody to violence in a controlled yes. setting than ECQC? Because I don't want, like, if... I don't want the first time my daughter to be attacked. I don't want my daughter attacked anyway. Yeah. yeah. But I don't want the first time for her to be in that, a situation like that for sure to her not know what to do this leads me to if you don't mind two interesting ways we can tell you this one an aside and then back to that because it's smart so the first aside is i think we were looking at the past with rose tinted glasses for just a moment because something you said <laughs> reminded me the reason i stopped shooting uspsa when i was like 16 was some gun magazine convinced me a competition to get you killed in the streets <laughs> <laughs> so let's not just lionize the gut like some somebody talking about a stetchkin like convinced me that's gonna get me killed in the streets so <laughs> it wasn't all good i don't like i'm I, not doing this anymore <laughs> yeah oh no I, I i might i might reload the wrong way like something horrible i don't know what i was thinking it was a regrettable time uh but well, good uh, on you for admitting that it was before the philosophy degree though right i didn't couldn't think my way through the problem <laughs> um but the other thing about like the idea of preparing someone for violence right this is an interesting idea and i think it i think it goes beyond even just you know what class or how but i think it asks a bigger question right because you to me there's always this like tension in the training community between like the professional violence people and then like the the hobbyists like a guy like me right and I think the professional violence people, like gatekeeping violence culture, is super important. Like they need to do that. That that's like mandatory because if you don't gatekeep the yahoos, people, real people, get hurt unnecessarily, right? But that creates a tension where you know, like the average Joe's want to, hey, I just want to learn how to protect my family, protect myself, whatever. Like, well, where do I fit in this, right? And there's always that little, you know, attend, you know, this difficulty. This difficulty is exacerbated when average Joe is a USPSA GM, the been there, done there guy is like a B-class shooter. This now introduces like another level of tension of like, well, I mean, who knows what, what's more important, what matters, right? And of course, I think the ideal preparation for anything, not just violence, the ideal preparation for anything is, you know, experience and training. Like, like deep knowledge, but also the emotional control that comes with familiarity and lack of uh, novelty right but experience is expensive experience a lot of people don't survive their experience your experience can leave physical mental emotional trauma you may not come back from experience the way you wanted to come back from it so we also want to hedge our bets we don't want all right all right, little Timmy, go out there and, you know, just hang out in the parking lot all night. And we'll, you know, eventually, you know, you'll get mugged. We'll be back in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you'll get mugged and you'll have some experience. We'll be ready to go, right? Um, that's not, one, there's no context that works in for people that are not violence professionals, right? Like, there's just, there's, that doesn't exist. You may wander your way into violence, right? You know, someone might attack you, whatever things happen. 
but there's no like roadmap to, okay, I'm ready now, I'm prepared, right? Whereas as a professional, you are inculcated in this culture, you have a moral, legal, whatever responsibility to do whatever you signed up for as a policeman, soldier, et cetera. And now you're in a culture of like-minded people who presumably many of them have experience and are going to guide you through that process and make you a member of a team, a unit, or whatever that is now part of this project of policing this community or, you know, like fighting this war or whatever. There's just not that for the average Joes. And so there's always this, this strange kind of tension between the average Joes and the real deal guys. And um, I always find that interesting. And it's something no one wants to talk about because it's sensitive for everybody. So here we are being weird. So with citizens defense research, where can people find your schedule? Where to train with you at? The, the, Best place is you can look us up on Eventbrite Citizens Defense Research. You can also look us up on Facebook. Our Facebook uh, page is the most active. We pump out articles pretty regularly. Um, you know, what I like, people have tried to get me to come teach for a long time, and no one could convince me to do it because I have a day job. Uh, I have a very, very, very busy day job. And um, so, and it's just not, you know, I've always, it's been a personal practice. It hasn't been, I've never been a proselytizer. Like, I, I really, believe in the work of Claude Werner and something he says I've never tried to convince someone to carry a gun ever like I agree with Claude like it's like it's a decision tantamount to which person am I going to marry what religion am I going to be like carrying a gun is a huge there's like legal like moral and metaphysical consequences for that and I would not pressure someone in either direction i might pressure someone not to i've told several people hey man maybe you're not quite ready to do that but i've told a lot more people not to carry a gun than i have told them to carry a gun right and um i think we don't talk about that enough either right so citizens sense research one of the reasons they got me involved and they got me to kind of buy in and join the team it's one i believe in the team i believe in the people i believe in melody and john and the rest of the gang but two i like their approach to things it's, it's very much this is hey regular people how do you live your life your normal life but with the confidence and knowledge necessary that if, God forbid, something terrible ever happens to you in your life involving interpersonal violence, you have the tools to navigate that, hopefully avoid it, and if it's completely unavoidable, to navigate it as successfully as possible, right? I think that's a great framework to start in because we don't have that police or military framework where well, this is your job, this is your duty, right? Like you're deciding your duty, you're deciding your level of involvement. Hey, they're robbing the liquor store and you're there just, you know, trying to buy your Blantons and uh, it's allocated, it's in the back, it's got your name on it, right? So they're robbing the fancy liquor store and you're there trying to get your Blantons. Do you intervene? Do you not? Well, cop, yeah, you, there's an SOP for that. Well, according to policy 43J, you need to do this. You don't have that. So, you know, I like that CDR. It's very much oriented I feel like I'm not out of my lane teaching at CDR because I'm not teaching. You know, if a, a cop or soldier wants to learn from me concealed carry stuff, I'm happy to teach him. But that's not what I'm trying to market myself as because that's not who I am, right? CDR is about just normal people or cool people when they're in their street clothes with their families. Like, hey, here's stuff we have to offer that maybe you don't get in that other context, right? Like just from this purely you're in the grocery store, you have kids, you know, like John and Melody do their armed parent guardian class, you know, like these unique kind of topics and niches directed towards cool people when they're not working, but also just regular people living their lives. And I found that to be a very I think a paradigm was, I could buy into. I think that was one of the, the best class that I've taken since I've been taking classes was that parent or guardian class like that was yeah we took that together yeah all three of us yeah. were, were yeah, in that right. class yeah. and all four of us actually you were you were there for yeah i think it was um you know very it's not a cool guy helicopter you know kicking down doors thing but it's like as somebody i don't have any kids but these guys do it's a very useful class that's stuff that you necessarily don't think about all the time oh I, yeah i don't have kids either but i have kids in my life yeah I've got, exactly I've got eight god kids you know what I mean? F between four different couples, like I eight god kids. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's just like, like there are children around, you know what I mean? Even in me, like a childless person's life, right? So um, that's something that just is not going to get brought up in like SOPs for a department or something. It's just not there, right? And so when I took the class for the first time, just as like a paying student, mm -hmm. 
what impressed me was there was a kid there. You could tell his like dad had like made him come. Like mm-hmm. you're gonna come do gun stuff with me. And the kid was like, "But dad, like I really like the NPR." Of, yeah, the no. new Call of Duty came out. No, not even. It was like, I really like NPR, and I'm very sensitive, and I'm very skeptical <laughs> of this whole gun thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, you could tell the dad just like talked him to coming to like the lecture portion, but the kid stayed the whole weekend because <laughs> he was interested. Yeah. And because the material was good, mm-hmm. because even a hostile audience was like, well, this isn't what I expected. They're not talking macho, he-man, hater, burn them yeah. down stuff. They're talking, well, hey, you're, how do you minimize damage? And like, These are like, real considerations, you know. It's like real, real life stuff. Exactly. And I was so impressed by that. This kid who didn't want to be there was actively hostile, chose to stay and stay and watch the range portions. He didn't even shoot or participate. Mm-hmm. But he wanted to, like, well, this is interesting. I never thought about this stuff. What I really liked about I mean, there, there's a ton of stuff in that, that arm parent guardian that's fantastic. But what I really liked about it was I think that's the first class where I've ever started off with my hand on a gun. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, it's like, hey, we're going to do this. You want to get a, a guaranteed sub-second draw? Let's do this. Start with your hand on a gun. I'm like, oh, yeah, because if you could, you would. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I went from being by far the best first shot to hit guy to, like, I have two, three other guys ahead of me when you start hand on gun. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, all right, well, I guess I'm nobody, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, you want my draw without all the hundreds of thousands of hours of dry fire? Just start with your hand on the gun. And right. Oh, yeah. You and I, are, you're probably oh, going to beat me. We did that at Average Joe's a couple weekends ago. Uh, we were up training with them, and I had, I haven't shot with a Safari SLS holster oh, in a decade. Yeah. And I wore it that weekend because it was cold, mm-hmm. and we were shooting rifle too. So I was like, all right, cool. And so when we were shooting, on a timer with a pistol, I was, I'm in mean like two, two fives first shot. And he's like, all right, let's do this. I'm like, I'm just going to start with my hand on the gun already. He's like, oh, okay, sure. And blah, 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 you know, <laughs> he's like, holy crap, you cut a second and a half off your time. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> Oy, I was there already. <laughs> like it was a sub, t- a way sub to build drill and like, mm-hmm. cool. But start with your hand on the gun. You're halfway. The fight's halfway. It's like won. doing a zero to 60 when you're starting at 10. Yeah. Yep. It's like I'm, I've already, <laughs> already skipped first gear. <laughs> yeah, we're yep. good. We're good. No, it, it's a magic trick. Kirk, dude, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Uh, we really appreciate it today. Thank you. all appreciate you all having me. And for those tuning in, let us know how you like this episode. If you've got any questions for us, put it in the comment section, leave us a review, and we will see you next time.